The next person that I want to introduce is uh, unique for our center. Ever since I came here in 1998, our clientele have been telling us about how much they need economic support, how they need decision-making tools that can help them uh, decide between different management procedures or different forage crops or marketing <laughs> options for their beef cattle. And we have struggled to fill that position until recently. And this was really thinking out of the box with our faculty here and Dr. Nick Place, who is our Dean for Cooperative Extension, Director of Cooperative Extension in the state of Florida. And he allowed us to hire what we call a regional specialized agent in livestock and forage economics. And we searched for that person and uh, about two years ago was able to hire Chris Pravat. So it's my pleasure, many of you have met Chris, read about what he's doing in the Florida Cattlemen, but it's my pleasure to introduce him today to uh, tell you a little bit about his program. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you this morning. Um, uh, tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I love the cattle industry. My family's been uh, raising cattle here since the early 1800s. Uh, so that's why I'm so enthusiastic about the cattle industry. I was in Sebring on, uh, on, uh, on Tuesday night, and uh, you know I was talking about cattle prices and uh, the way you know the, the cattle prices have turned down over the last 18 months. And uh, after the program, uh, a young lady came up and asked me why I was so enthusiastic about uh, the, the $700 that we've lost on cattle prices, and I'm not necessarily happy about that. It's just I, I love grasping and understanding of, you know, the way our markets work for us. So, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons that uh, I've, I've, I've chosen this position to be here at ONA uh, is because John's been so willing to, uh, to uh, allow me to do what I love here. Uh, just to give you a little background about how I arrived here at ONA, um, I had uh, uh, three job opportunities, and uh, within three-week time period, I got all three offers. Luckily, um, uh, there's on, there was only one institution that would really let me focus on my, my number one passion here, and that's forages. Um, at Colorado State, you know, they, they just wanted me to focus on marketing, and, and I would do marketing throughout the United States, but, but John and uh, Joao Vendramini and Brent Sellers and, and Maria here, they really uh, they, they understood why I was so excited about forages and what that means for our cattle industry here. So um, that was the, probably the, the number one factor. The number two factor is that I'd had to buy about $5,000 worth of coats if I was going to stay there at Colorado State. And then when my wife, she's in vet school, when she got there, that cost me about another $10,000. So, uh, you know, it was really it was an economic decision overall to, uh, to, to choose the University of Florida. And it's just such a great resource here that, that we have. I'll start talking about my economics program. Um, I've been given a lot of beef cattle market outlooks lately, and uh, overall, um, I'm going to tell you that I was sitting in the University of Florida's library on campus there in, uh, in April of 2015, and I started looking at um, the laying numbers that were coming out of the broiler industry and, and the litter numbers that were coming out of the pork industry. And there at that 2015 beef cattle uh, a short course that we had there in Gainesville, um, I told a lot of people during a, 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 at the highest point that we've ever seen in the cattle market that things were about to get bad. Um, and I never really understood exactly how bad they were about to get because economists, it's, it's, we understand the direction of the market. However, we don't do a very good job of understanding magnitude because there's so many variables that are involved in our cattle market. Um, so obviously over the last... Uh, 18 months here, we've had a tremendous decline in these cattle prices. Um, you know, from the top to, to where we are now, we've lost about 56.8%. Um, and as we look at what beef production might do over the next two to three years, um, we're going to look at another 6 to 8% loss in these feeder calf prices. Um, and that's, that's not good for us in the cow-calf industry. Um, typically, we look at a, at a cattle cycle. We, the top is, is our 2013 to 2015 prices. That's our top of the cattle price cycle. Currently, we're in this downward price transition. Um, and I'd like to say that uh, the way that uh, cattle prices have declined, that that would be um, 
the, it, obviously it's the major, majority of what change is going to happen, but uh, we're still, you know, we're still years from the bottom. Um, and that's, that's occurring because of a couple things. Obviously it's, uh, it's uh, total production levels. I'm talking about meat production in terms of, uh, in terms of pork and poultry, and then you had throw beef in there. Last year, uh, the, one of the major reasons for this declining prices were poultry production and pork production. Poultry production up 8% last year. This year, they're going to be up 5% more. Beef production only up, uh, you know, between 1% to 2%. Still looking back at what those estimates, uh, if they're going to adjust some of those estimates, but 1% to 2% in beef production – that's simply occurring because of what we're doing to these slaughter weights. You know, our average is there coming out of the, the feedlots over the last uh, two years. We're still, you know, we're 50 pounds on those slaughter weights above the averages. That's where the beef production, the increase in that beef production is occurring over the last two years. And that gives us a little cause for concern. We've got this, this herd expansion that started really in 2014. Uh, continued throughout 2015, and and as I look at you know the slaughter numbers for these heifers that were coming out of the feedlot, I know during the first half of of 2016 here we were still expanding at the same rate that we were during 2015. All the heifer numbers that are coming out, we're still at those 2015 level level numbers. We talk about what slaughter cows um, have done over the last. Uh, over the last few years in terms of really holding back some of those older cows there in your herd, the first half of 2016, numbers didn't change from where they were at, at uh, where they were in 2015. So uh, overall there, that's going to lay the foundation for this beef production from the herd expansion uh, that's been occurring over the last two years specifically. Um, so as, as this expansion, we're going to see it continue here. Uh, in 2016, even though calf prices uh, have dropped off, dropped off so much, uh, l basically limited herd expansion in 2017. So what I'm looking for um, in this downward price transition is is really getting into 2018, 2019 before we get to the bottom of this cattle price cycle. Um, the, the bottom we're typically looking at in there between 2019 and and 2022 to to hit the bottom and then really start up on a, another run up in terms of cattle prices. Now that's not that's not necessarily uh, uh, you know a very exciting thing to hear. Um, however, I think we're going to talk a little bit about the other side of the equation and that's what I think we're really going to have to focus on. Um, so one thing that's that's really been happening over the last month that's you know it's exciting as to, for an economist to actually see it, they've studied about it for so long is price inversion. Um, and what we see with price inversion is that slaughter cattle prices are higher than feeder calf prices. And that's what we see in the local stockyards throughout the southeast right now is, uh, is what they're selling these uh, feeder calves for through the ring are less than what you could sell a 1,300-pound a, a feeder steer at, in the, in the front, coming out of the feedlot for uh, to these packers. Um, and that occurs very rarely. And the reason for that occurrence is because they know when these 550-pound feeder steers that are coming out of Florida, Georgia, and Alabama, they know that the price is going to decline significantly between this year and when those uh, animals are slaughtered. So uh, we, we hope that this is a very short-term trend, but uh, price inversion is real right now. We're seeing it through every single uh, – Everything, every single stockyard that we have here uh, in the southeast and in, in Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina, um, and many other stockyards as well, that price aversion is occurring in our livestock market. Um, we talk about expansion, uh, continuing to see that, uh, that calf crop grow. Um, that's going to uh, be a major detriment in terms of uh, beef production moving forward. Uh, poultry and pork, we expect them to, to slow up over um, the next – uh, two to three years really to uh, to slow up on their uh, on their on their litters in the hog industry and the 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 layers that they have in the poultry industry. Um, so overall, but meat protein's growing, and that uh, it gives us some, some concern there in terms of where we were um, in terms of of yields here in the beef cattle industry as we continue to grow. Um, 
the total meat production in the the, the beef cattle industry that's what's really going to be uh, the driver here in, in lower cattle prices um, you know a couple more things about total beef production uh, the imports you know we're we're 1.3 percent less than where we were last year on beef imports and that puts us in a, a much better situation on 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 imports however uh on exports, we're not really making much improvements. I don't expect uh, substantial improvements in exports over the next few years until go global incomes really start to rise. When global incomes rise, that's when we're going to see um, better demand for our product. Demand is, you know, uh, typically we think of demand as like our, our desire for a product, but, you know, that desire ultimately depends on where price is. So uh, demand, it's increased uh, a couple months during 2016, but that's ultimately because we've uh, decreased the price of our product. Um, additionally, on exports, uh, you know, they, we opened the Chinese market. Um, it's supposed to be open here soon. Uh, you know, working out a deal with them, uh, I would say that uh, that's going to be a difficult process, and I don't uh, expect a very uh, smooth scenario to occur there. Um, so I gave you a bad spiel on where cattle market prices are going. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the other side of the equation and, and what kind of we're thinking about here at ONA. Um, you know, I sat down with Dr. Vengermini about three years ago and uh, and uh, just talked about forages here in Florida as I got here. You know, limpo grass and star grass, I didn't have much experience with those um, running a, a ranch in North Florida and Southwest Alabama. We don't come across those forages very often. Um, so, so speaking with Dr. Vengermini, uh, we talked about what forages we could implement here and, and looked at different ways that we could make a reduction in costs. And as we look, you know, as we look f for the next four to five years, um, with, without those high cattle prices to really offset our, um, uh, some of those additional expenses, it's going to be a reduction. I believe that uh, our, our way out of this equation is going to be a reduction in, in forage costs, and it's going to be focusing on efficiencies that we have in forage production. Um, so over the last three years, I can definitely tell you, Dr. Vengermini, uh, his, uh, his program has definitely improved uh, just by having, you know, a producer and a researcher here on site to help him out with, uh, with his uh, forage program. Um, so we're, we began looking at more legumes in our system. I believe that, you know, uh, reducing those fertilizers in our system can make us a lot more efficient, um, as well as, you know, increasing our total forage production. Uh, we talk about what's the most economically important variable in our equation. Um, and I would say that, you know, sometimes uh, economics, uh, without putting real-world uh, scenarios in our, in our models, that it'll give us the wrong answer. You know, I ask you, uh, has anyone here doubled their, their weaning percentage or their pregnancy percentage uh, over the last 20, 25 years? You know, but if I asked you if you've doubled your stocking rate over the last 25, 30 years, you would probably tell me that you have by implementing improved uh, forage varieties and, uh, and increasing utilization of those forages. So typically, um, uh, you know, a lot of people like to quote their reproductions, the most uh, economically efficient uh, variable in our, in our uh, beef cattle production systems, but I would argue that uh, in the real world that, uh, you know, forages and cost of forage production uh, and implementing improved varieties and, and utilization is our most economically uh, important variable to our cattle operation. And uh, I look forward to, to spending time with you and working with you uh, over the next several years.